Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. My name is Cecile Ambert. I'm uh, the administrator of the private sector credit enhancement facility. I've been uh, asked to uh, welcome you and to request uh, your indulgence whilst we wait for uh, other participants to join us. Uh, so far, uh, Fatma, how many uh, participants do we have? We are uh, at 50 per attendees so far. So just one more minute and uh, we'll kick off the webinar. Okay. Not more. Not more, no. <laughs> we have to start soon. <laughs> So I'm going to start. So again, well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be uh, given the opportunity to share with you uh, some information and experiences related to the private sector facility. I have uh, requested uh, somebody who is familiar with the facility, but uh, from the bank side, uh, Richard Fusi to uh, join me in this uh, presentation and whereas I will speak about the management of the facility, eligibility criteria, business process, some of the things we've done and learned, he will share with you um, his experience um, taking projects through in a very difficult country, uh, being the first among uh, MDBs and DFIs to originate not one, but two uh, large uh, transactions in Sudan. Uh, and those two transactions uh, have been um, uh, with PSF risk participation. So uh, Richard, uh, welcome. Um, and uh, we'll uh, have the opportunity to exchange on some of the specifics. So without further ado, let me find uh, my share screen button and get this presentation going. Um, if it works, share. Um, okay, so uh, by way of background, the um, private sector credit enhancement facility, uh, there's two words that we often uh, omit when we're talking about the facility using uh, an acronym is, is the PSF. Um, it was initiated in 2015, and what I want to clarify is that the process to get to the facility to be um, uh, bought into by senior management and uh, donors who are the ADF deputy was not straightforward. It took quite a lot of, of uh, design and structuring work and consultation work but uh, we started with the first operations in 2020. And I want to flag that this was even before the IDA, um, the World Bank's concessional window uh, started with its uh, private sector window. So we were forerunners, the FDB was a forerunner in, in uh, using some concessional resources to do more um, non-sovereign operations in low-income country. I mentioned that also because that is our focus in terms of mandate and purpose and operational modalities. During this presentation, I'll talk about, about our instrument, which is an unfunded risk participation. And uh, the maximum size that we are allowed to risk participate is UA 50 million. Thus far, we've received contributions from ADF 13, 14, and 15. And what we are looking at at the moment and actively working on actually is uh, structuring re-guarantees to do more and uh, more impactful. The overall structure of the facility is uh, as follows. So one is that we have approximately 465 million units of account of capital, which we have not fully drawn down, obviously, to guarantee up to 1.1 billion of non-sovereign operations. And that's quite um, innovative uh, and different from most trust funds in that 
we operate as a leveraged vehicle. Um, and we try to get as much uh, effect in terms of using this uh, capital as collateral to participate or to risk share or to guarantee transactions of the African Bank, uh, African Development Bank in low income countries. And as a result of this form of guarantee, the bank holds less risk capital against each transaction. And the risk capital that is uh, released can then be used for new non sovereign operations in uh, low income countries. Um, and why that is, why that, that modality? Um, I think one of the key issue is that the problem that we try to address is that uh, this is something that you may know if you're familiar with non-sovereign operations, um, but each non-sovereign operation has, gets given a credit risk rating, uh, which defines the likelihood that the borrower will fail to meet their repayment obligation. And uh, the, best, or the, 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 the best ever rating is the country risk rating. And so in ADF countries and el countries eligible to the TSF, we have on average uh, a country risk rating that is over the high risk ceiling for the bank. And so in turn, what this means is that uh, non-sovereign operations in transi transition countries can attract uh, up to four times the amount of risk capital that exactly the same project in a middle income country. Um, and so that's, that's the sort of challenge that we're trying to deal with. How we work, I mentioned earlier that our instrument is an unfunded risk participation. It's a form of guarantee and there are different types of guarantee instruments. The unfunded risk participation is a contractual commitment between the participants, so in this case, the PSF, and the lender in terms of the cash flows underpinning a contract on the principle of risk and fee sharing. And what it does is that it's a commitment that the PSF will make whole up to a certain percentage of principal interest penalties the lender if the borrower doesn't pay. Um, and um, whilst we were preparing our revised framework, we sought and obtained an external legal opinion on the Basel compliance of the risk participation in terms of um, recognition of uh, uh, its effect in terms of risk-weighted uh, risk weighted assets uh, reduction for the bank. Uh, the PSF is on demand. There's no need for the lender to pursue recoveries. It's irrevocable and it's unconditional. There is no contractual relationship between the borrower and the participant. And at all times, the borrower, the lender, i.e. the ADB, is the lender of record. And that's very important because what we're trying to do is to ensure that there's no moral hazard on the part of uh, the borrower who uh, may uh, decide to uh, miss or skip a payment because it knows that the bank is partially covered. The overall contractual frame between the bank and the PSF is called a master risk participation agreement. Those of you who are familiar with trade finance um, know these kinds of, of, uh, of agreements, which is, provides the overall contractual uh, rights and obligations between parties and for each operation that we risk participate there's a specific uh, certificate that is issued and I've highlighted in blue but perhaps I should have highlighted it in, um, in red and, and uh, Richard will tell us a little bit more about this that risk sharing is not risk reduction uh, in other words uh, it's not it doesn't having a risk participant somebody who take some of the risks with you, doesn't uh, take away or doesn't reduce or doesn't mitigate the intrinsic risks. In terms of business process, I've, what I've tried to do here is to uh, identify the various steps that the bank uh, undertakes in uh, originating and uh, approving, signing, and dispersing and uh, uh, processing or managing uh, the situation if the borrower 
uh, defaults. And on the right, the roles and, and responsibilities uh, and the steps that uh, PSF undertakes in uh, considering and recommending whether uh, a risk participation. Uh, I do want to stress that uh, in terms of institutional arrangements, the private sector, um, the PINS department is the contractual interface so coordinates with uh, operations, sector operations, with uh, PGRF, with FIST, uh, and various other FIFC uh, departments in the identification of uh, of uh, operations to, rec to, to request a risk participation, uh, but throughout also the life cycle of that operation and, um, and uh, risk participation. So if there's a claim, they're the ones who will trigger the claim process. They're the ones who uh, review some of the, the and, and facilitate uh, uh, compliance certification, et cetera, et cetera. On our side, what we do is undertake an independent, and I stress independent, eligibility verification um, uh, activity. And then that means that uh, we'll go through the, the, the eligibility criteria, we verify and settle claims, and we rely on the bank to undertake its supervision uh, activities and to uh, undertake recovery, restructuring, and write up. A point that I would like to flag is that um, the ADB board approving a loan doesn't necessarily translate automatically into an approval of the risk participation into that loan. And I, I will go into why. Um, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, part of why is that there are sets of eligibility criteria that are applied, uh, particularly in respect of country. Uh, it's ADF eligible countries with uh, some provisions for regional operations uh, if two thirds of the proceeds flow to ADF countries. In terms of eligible instruments, um, we risk participate all sort of loans and guarantee instruments and we recently processed our first risk participation in a subordinated loan. Uh, this is a, a, an innovation in terms of the revised framework, the st st statutory framework that was approved by the board in December last year. Uh, we felt that it was very important to add subordinated debt because it's an incredibly catalytic instrument, especially in um, riskier countries. Um, the age of the operation, we can risk participate both both new and ongoing operations. So in other words, loans that have already started dispersing, uh, but to ensure that uh, we focus on uh, those areas where we are additional, the loan must be less than five years of age. We have a minimum ADOA rating and for ongoing operations, we make sure and we verify that there's not been a default or a materially, material adverse change in project risk. Um, if you want to know more about the eligibility criteria, I strongly recommend, and I should have put a link in the, in the presentation to our revised framework. Uh, it's in DARMS, and I will ask Fatma to circulate it alongside with, uh, with the presentation. The second dimension or second areas we look into when we uh, uh, review eligibility and, and uh, select a transaction to prioritize and size the risk participation are a set of prioritization uh, considerations. So one is we try to achieve a very diversified portfolio because uh, that's a source of, of strength. Um, and we have a strong appetite for transition countries because that's part of our mandate. Um, we want to focus on the infrastructure and the real economy sectors. We know, however, that uh, the financial sector in many transition countries is, uh, is a key player to reach, particularly SMEs. Um, we look at the project risk on a standalone basis because for us, yes, the country risk rating is the ceiling. But we have much stronger appetite for a good project, a solid project in a very high risk country. 
than a um, speculative project or a project that has a lot of unmitigated risk in a low risk country. And there's other issues that we'll be looking at in the manner in which the operation has been structured, uh, notably in terms of synergies with sovereign operations. We look at potential impact on debt sustainability, in, for instance, the manner in which contracts have been structured. We look at uh, economic opportunities for women. We look at fragility assessments. Sorry, I should have highlighted that point, as well as gender and uh, climate mainstreaming. Again, these prioritization criteria are in the framework. Uh, in terms of governance body, things are changing. Uh, initially, it was primarily the ADF board uh, with the team of the PSF administrator, the PSF administrator team. Um, what we have uh, uh, put in place and is currently under mobilization is an independent risk and claims committee, which is uh, will comprise independent members or members who are non-resident but independent of ADB staff and management to undertake uh, technical oversight. And we are thinking ahead uh, and planning for a contributors committee to act as a consultative platform. In terms of uh, track record to date, 50 risk participation. I do want to flag that some have matured already, some have been canceled. Um, and uh, the 50 risk participations concern uh, 542 million um, worth of uh, exposures in uh, 1.9 billion worth of loans. We want to get greater uh, diversity in terms of the country coverage. And we know that there's a number of countries where the bank itself doesn't have operations as yet. Um, and we're really keen to see ways in which we can um, support the bank, uh, make those firsts in those countries. In terms of uh, performance of the portfolio, we note that approximately 22% is watchlisted. Um, we have two, three loans that are with uh, special operations, but only one loan thus far has had claims. Uh, we anticipate more uh, will come with a more seasoned portfolio, and that is uh, what we are here for. That's part of our core business, to settle claims when and, 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 and as they occur. In terms of impact and examples of successful operations, um, so I want to start by mentioning that 2020 was a bit of an exceptional year, not just for the ADB NSO, but more generally FDI and private project finance transactions globally and in Africa. So we didn't see much, but um, what was interesting is up until then, one of the key um, effects is or contributions of the, the facility was a, a quite a radical increase in the number or the volume of NSO approvals in low-income countries and in transition states. And what we want to be there to help the bank do more of is uh, to support firsts for the bank, I mentioned Sudan, but we've done that in Zimbabwe and in Chad. Um, what we're looking towards to do in 2021 is we realized that the COVID situation has had very uh, constraining impacts in terms of risk capital at the level of the bank. And where, where feasible, we'd like to be uh, coming in quite upstream in project processing uh, so that it addresses some of the high risk capital constraints for NSOs, which might otherwise um, discourage uh, the processing of new operations. Uh, and in the more medium term, we're very interested in looking at ways in which we could adapt the risk participation structure um, more flexibly. So for some of the programs that the bank is leading on, for instance, Desert to Power, um, th those things where the size of the projects are, tend to be small, uh, we're looking at the possibility of structured portfolio guarantees and the like uh, so that uh, we are more effective. But uh, without further ado, perhaps I can hand over to Richard to share with us some of his uh, experiences. And, um, and uh, yeah, Richard, please.
Thanks very much, uh, Cecile, and uh, welcome again to, to, to our colleagues. Um, the specific example that I'm going to talk about here uh, um, is uh, the case of uh, the bank's pioneering non-sovereign operation in, uh, in Sudan, uh, specifically with uh, Dal Group. And I would want to start off uh, by just emphasizing uh, a point that Cecil has mentioned about the, the characteristic of the, of the PSF um, as an unfunded uh, risk participation. But in this picture, we are bringing in uh, an example of an actual transaction. Um, I, I was trying to make it clear here that the client to PSF in this case is the AFDB. And then the borrower uh, to whom AFDB is the lender of record is actually the client of the bank. So the PSF in itself is an unfunded risk participation, but it's also an undisclosed risk participation. Undisclosed because we do not, uh, it is not borrower facing. It faces the client, which is AFDB, but it is not um, an instrument or a facility that covers, uh, per se, the borrower in this case. So um, that's why I say it's an undisclosed uh, risk participation. It's not part of the agreements that we sign with the client or with the borrower. So um, for, 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 for Dow Group, specifically the case of Sudan is that Sudan is a fragile um, or classified as a fragile transition state. And the key characteristic of uh, such countries uh, is that they are predominantly um, very high risk uh, rated. Um, they, they, they have very limited uh, ceiling, you know, for, 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 for high risk transactions. And of course, the headroom that is typically available for NSO transactions in those countries is also limited. So um, in the specific case of Dow Group, the, the bank uh, had to do a lot of um, upfront and pre-transaction client engagement work, um, collaborating as well with some uh, specific units across the bank and with the country office before or to prepare and make this transaction uh, doable. So uh, the, the main thing that is done upfront was uh, uh, involved in assessing you know, um, the, the, the transaction on a standalone basis and in line with the bank's NSO guidelines as well as the credit and risk framework. So uh, mainly the, the origination team in this place uh, has to ensure or make sure um, that the, the client being a country where, you know, typically they do not work with DFIs and may not be familiar with our own criteria. But then the main thing is the innate characteristic of such challenging business environment, uh, which is, uh, as, as I've just mentioned, you know, the high risk uh, nature and the, the, the the, the, how do they put it, the, the headroom limitations, and of course, um, the, the, the country ceiling. I think Cecile already mentioned the fact that NSO uh, activities in these countries, um, the, the risk category of NSO uh, categories in, this, in these countries typically um, goes above the cutoff limit uh, that we will have for transactions that are acceptable within the bank's uh, risk framework. So the high risk nature of these kind of transactions, the country risk ceiling, the headroom, and of course the implication for risk capital consumption is the key challenge that we have to face. But for the origination team, I think the, the main thing that we did from uh, onset was to identify and assess um, this transaction or the client and the risk uh, involved in this transaction on a standalone basis. When I say standalone basis, it is at that onset being oblivious or deliberately being blind to the fact that PSF is going to participate or not. So the, um, I mean, the typical risk like the for foreign exchange risk, uh, the potential structural subordination, the risk linked to the business environment, the operational risk, the market risk. So all of these were identified, assessed, and then acceptable uh, or appropriate mitigation measures are put in place um, to cater for each of these specific risks and ensure that ultimately um, the residual risk, as I would call it, fall within the acceptable uh, risk capital of the bank. 
and in line with the bank's own uh, credit and risk uh, framework. So identifying, assessing, and putting measures in place to reduce um, the risk exposure of the bank and to minimize the likelihood of any of the identified risks actually happening is the key responsibility of the bank or of the origination team. Um, and this goes to emphasize a point that um, Cecile made about risk participation not being risk reduction because the PSFs, um, the PSF participates in whatever risk the bank has now accepted to take on its books, which means that by the time PSF comes into the picture, the related risks to the project must have been assessed and found or assessed uh, mitigation measures put in place and then found acceptable to the bank on the basis of the bank's credit risk guidelines, the bank's acceptable risk appetite. So PSF's participation actually shares in the risk that the bank is taking on its books as opposed to reducing the identified risk to the transaction. So that, 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 that differentiation is important to be made and it underlines the need when origination trans on originating transactions in these um, challenging environments to ensure that the risks that are there are identified and that they are properly mitigated in line with the bank's own credit risk frameworks. Um, so I've already mentioned the, the, the key challenges um, and, and characteristics you know, of transactions or NSO transactions in, in fragile and transition states, which is typically the fact that the, they, they fall within a category that averagely goes above the, the, the limits uh, of, of, of the bank's um, threshold you know, for acceptable risk. Now, I think this, this is really what then and, or underlies the critical importance of the private sector um, uh, facility. Because in a country like Sudan, typically it is not just high risk, but very high risk if we classify, if we want to uh, categorize the risk of a transaction in Sudan, because Sudan as a country, as Cecil mentioned, the country risk, a transaction in a country cannot be rated better than the, the, the risk rating of that country. And Sudan is already rated, I think, above six, which is very high risk. So if you consider that the bank was to go in there with a 100 million or a 50 million transaction per se, uh, the case of Dow Group was a multi-currency transaction which was equivalent to about 75 million. So if the bank was going in there without the participation of um, uh, the PSF, uh, first of all, 75 million, um, I think that's in US dollars, but if that was in UA, it would exceed, I think the country headroom uh, for Sudan, which I think at that time was about 50 million alone. Secondly, it means that the bank's risk capital consumption would have been hit smart head on with 75 million directly um, uh, without, because this is like really high risk. And of course, in terms of uh, the high risk rating, of course, it will then be for the bank to judge whether truly we want to go and put up to 75 million worth of our total 100% exposure on our books in a high risk environment. But then with uh, PSF coming in, and uh, let me say with 50% participation, then it means that within the bank's own books, you know, what actually sits on our books, we share it with the PSF. And again, I'm using the word share to emphasize what Cecile mentioned, that whatever we're sharing now is beyond what we would have already mitigated. So. PSF is not coming in to reduce the risk, but whatever risk we have accepted to take on our books, we are sharing it 50-50 with the PSF. So first that allows us, or our, instead of 75 million consumption on our risk capital, we are relieved, the PSF will relieve 50% of that by taking on a 50% participation, which enables the bank to go out again and deploy that extra uh, 50% in another um, um, in another um, uh, transaction. So I am mentioning all of this just to highlight the fact that um, the, the critical importance of PSF is that it allows us to do more than what we would normally be able to do on a standalone basis. So we are able to intervene and increase the scope of the bank's interventions uh, in these kind of high risk uh, countries or high risk uh, ADF type countries and the fragile uh, and transition states. 
I would also like to uh, maybe touch on a typical misconception at the early stage of transaction origination, where uh, we may be tempted to think that the PSF um, potential, I say potential because at the onset, until you have an actual eligibility certificate uh, confirming PSF participation, it will be, um, I would say, I, want, I don't want to use unethical because that looks like a very strong word, but it will not be accurate to state or claim in any committee within the bank that is assessing that transaction that PSF is supposed or is going to participate. It is only when you have that actual um, um, confirmation that you would do so. So to avoid uh, clouding the, the, the actual assessment of that transaction on a risk basis, it is important to um, avoid that misconception that the PSF participation in any way would reduce the risk. So I normally would urge that uh, during origination, uh, we, 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 we only look at the transaction from the lens of a private sector transaction alone and within the framework on the, of the bank's credit risk um, framework um, and not to see PSF as any uh, instrument that may reduce uh, the risk participation. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. That may reduce the risk um, uh, profile or perception. So in, able, in, in order to, to, to work with the PSF secretariat, the main interface is PINs from the origination point of view. And uh, PIN serves you know, to uh, collect the key project information uh, to, to make an eligibility, uh, an, an eligibility opinion requests. Um, so it is the responsibility of the origination team to provide all that critical information to the PINs for them to be able to follow up uh, with the secretariat to bring that. So I will leave it there for now. And uh, Cecile, I will be happy to take uh, any might be questions later on if they are linked to you know anyone trying to get more on our experience working with the secretariat but uh, it's it's been really good and supportive and it makes a lot of sense uh, when we see that we are able to do more uh, in these countries that really need the bank's intervention by having PSF on these transactions it helps the bank to reach further than it would be able to do with uh, on a standalone basis so thank you So Fatma, are you going to moderate? Okay, thank you for your presentation and uh, all questions are welcome now. So uh, I will start with the, the question directed uh, to you, Cecile. Someone is asking, what is the name of the client to whom bank provided subordinate debt under PSF? This is from the chat. Uh, okay, it's a, uh, it's a lender. Um, so uh, assuming that we are all here under confidentiality as per our respective uh, staff and consultants uh, contract, it's a lender called uh, Equity Group Holding uh, as part of its expansion of activities in uh, DRC and uh, related countries. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, Richard, uh, someone needed uh, a deeper maybe uh, explanation about uh, how risk sharing is not risk reduction. Uh, he says it literally appears to be what the bank is doing. If you could explain again. Okay, I will try. Uh, but it's interesting that we have an anonymous attendee. <laughs> I, was, I wouldn't be expecting that from a webinar. Um, so risk sharing is, uh, is uh, or, or rather risk reduction is achieved through structuring. Um, risk sharing is you participate in the transaction uh, just as, uh, as it is. Uh, it doesn't take away the intrinsic risks, whether they be FX or market or uh, technology or th th those risks are uh, as is, just because you are uh, parting or transferring some of these risks 
to uh, to a third party doesn't mean that you've uh, reju reduced the, um, uh, the 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 fundamental intrinsic uh, probability that the borrower will default. It just means that if there is a default, you have a companion uh, who will make you partly whole uh, to substitute for the borrower in case of default. I hope that clarifies this. So, um, Cecile, if I if I may add, using the specific example of the transaction that we used, um, there is related to uh, the business environment, there is related to FX, um, there is related to structural subordination. We externalized uh, part of the, the risk to, to, to reduce our exposure to the business environment uh, by linking in operations from outside of that uh, business environment. The FX risk, uh, we put in place um, um, uh, a debt service reserve account, an offshore debt service reserve account that is capable of capturing revenues uh, directly outside of that environment. Uh, we included uh, cross guarantors into the uh, structure of the transaction, uh, which uh, strengthen you know, and reduce the potential for structural subordination. So all those actions that are taken to specifically reduce or minimize the likelihood of those identified risks from actually occurring or their impact if they do occur fall on that risk reduction. But then if out of the residual risk that remains, there happens to occur an event that causes us as borrow, as lender to suffer a loss, we have the probability of sharing that loss with someone else rather than taking it 100%, 100% hit. And at that level, that is participation. And just to okay. maybe also emphasize in um, both this transaction um, and another one that was undertaken um, in Sudan, um, we processed the risk participation in parallel or close to the same day as the underlying loan. And the reason why we felt very comfortable doing that is we saw that uh, the uh, rigor of the structuring and diligence process. So there were no um, outstanding issues that could affect eligibility. Um, and I mentioned this in relation to another question, so I'm, I'm answering uh, part of the question and adding uh, on to what uh, Richard was saying. Um, the processing of the risk participation uh, can take, um, uh, will generally follow the uh, timeline for processing the, um, the, the loans. There may be instances where by the time uh, the loan goes through uh, various credit review committees, there are still certain outstanding um, information, um, which means that we can't fully uh, confirm that uh, the loan is um, eligible. Um, and uh, there may be other factors that we take into account, such how that loan would affect our portfolio construction parameters. We have certain con concentration uh, limits. We've got certain um, portfolio quality limits, obviously reflecting a higher risk appetite than the banks. But uh, so there's no, there's no sort of um, set rule about how long it takes to process. Uh, what we've seen though, and maybe um, Richard in terms of the, the flow of information and, and uh, um, you know, it's, it, it depends on how, how advanced you are with uh, how, how, how ready the, the, the project is. Obviously, we understand that, uh, you know, in terms of risk capital constraint, uh, constraints, we, you know, that those shouldn't be, those shouldn't be um, disincentives to origination. Um, and so we, we're mindful of that. But if things like your integrity due diligence had, hasn't been done, if your uh, environmental and social safeguards uh, assessment hasn't been done and it's a category one project, um, we're not going to be running in front of you. Um, I see another question, which is, can we use PSF in middle income countries like Angola? 
So uh, there's two answers to that. So the first answer is no, if it's uh, for a single country project, because the PSF was set up with ADF resources and is focused uh, in terms of eligibility on um, ADF eligible countries with a prioritization for transition states and ADF only countries. What we do note though, is in the case of regional operations, provided at least two thirds of the process, the proceeds of the loan are used for um, ADF eligible countries, we may, uh, this may be considered. Uh, Um, so if the ceiling commitment that the PSF will cover is USD 50 million, what is the minimum level commitment that the facility will undertake? So just a correction, our ceiling is 50 million units of account. Uh, our sweet spot is between 25 and 35 million in terms of the size of the response station. We do not have a minimum size um, uh, of commitment quite simply because we know that in transition countries, your ability to find large chunky projects or big tickets is limited. Um, there are only so many um, projects and what that means is whether you're dealing with a corporate or with um, uh, an SME bank, uh, you have to be prepared to be responsive to smaller tickets. It takes the same amount of time in terms of verifying the eligibility and uh, recommendation and doing the paperwork and, and um, following up. It's exactly the same amount of time. But uh, if you want to be there in transition countries and with uh, SME segment, uh, that's what's required. Your willingness to accept small, small ticket size. Um, uh, is it possible to speak about rates of commitment at risk? If yes, kindly share with any comment in order to highlight how is of anticipate leadership and management. Um, so I wouldn't say, I wouldn't talk about commitment at risk. Um, what we've uh, recently do done, and we, we do this on a um, regular basis, um, is to review both the projects that are watchlisted by the bank. And here I mentioned earlier, it's about 22% on a national exposure basis of our portfolio, um, but just being watch listed doesn't necessarily mean that you are at risk because there are a range of reasons why um, a, a project might be put on watch lists, including for instance, um, country risk downgrade or, or, or various things like that. But um, you know, if we, uh, what, what we do see, and, and this has been part particularly true in the context of, of COVID, uh, we have looked at in a forward looking manner, the potential amount of claims which would be um, exposed to uh, from the month of June uh, forward. So if, if the uh, entire portfolio COVID that's uh, watch listed um, where to default, uh, we would be uh, liable to pay uh, approximately 21 uh, million UA. Um, that would be the sort of high stress scenario. Um, and we've also run another scenario profile where projects that are already with SOU or where we know that there are um, uh, certain stresses, we're looking at around six, 6 million between June and the end of the year. Um, noting that the risk participation is not accelerable. So, you know, we, we pay amounts as and when they fall due. Um, it's still so there, there is, there is a, Sorry, Sister, I, 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 you don't, I was about to draw your attention to another question which came up, but it's in the chat area, the chat section. So um, the question says, given that PSF participation is unfunded, how does PGRF 
pick the headroom created and transaction risk weighting. The bank exchanges its exposure for participation and not cash, as is the case with funded participation. Thanks, uh, thanks, Richard. So, uh, I guess uh, you know you might want to ask the question directly to PGRF uh, for the purpose of uh, in terms of Basel compliance. So, there's two there's two issues. Um, whilst the bank is not you know is not a, a supposed to be operating under under Basel uh, rules, uh, it does look at the Basel compliance of the instrument. And here it's important to recognize that we are not aiming to um, uh, provide a triple A level of credit enhancement because of the risk profile of the underlying uh, exposures in which we risk participate. We're only trying to provide a, um, a triple B level of uh, credit enhancement. And that means that from the perspective of uh, uh, risk capital relief, the bank applies a haircut to the uh, uh, risk capital relief effect, uh, amounting to 8% of the uh, risk capital because the bank carries the tail risk of having uh, uh, a triple B uh, rated uh, uh, credit risk counterparty, but it does provide a rating or it does undertake a rating substitution for the share of the exposure that is covered by uh, PSF risk participation. What it also means is that the bank doesn't car carry the um, liquidity management and liquidity um, risk uh, that would come with a funded uh, risk participation. So there, there, there are a couple of questions on the, on the process. Um, and I think this is from an origination point of view. There are about two or three. I'll just take them together, Cecile, if, 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 if that's OK. Um, so I know there's a question about how long it takes to, to process uh, a PSF participation and a question related to whether the task manager of a transaction is in charge of, uh, of, a, of an AFDB loan is also expected to prepare documentation uh, for, for PSF or if the PSF secretariat has separate resources uh, supporting the process. So. Um, as, as, as we mentioned, uh, I think the first thing about the process is that the PSF approval process is uh, independent of the AFDB approval process. Um, the, the, the AFDB approval process runs through the normal ecosystem, the, the NSO process flow goes through all the committees, goes to the ADB board. Uh, the PSF uh, approval process uh, goes through the, 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 is it the ADF board, Cecile? Good. So th those are those are independent uh, processes, and I think Cecile already uh, touched on that on the, the readiness um, that how long the process takes really depends on the readiness, um, the completeness, and the preparedness of um, the, the the project itself. So if there is a, you know a lack of information or there is incomplete information uh, from the onset. It can, it can significantly delay uh, the process, but do not expect that the two uh, processes must run hand in hand. I think the, 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 the specific case that Cecile mentioned that they went almost parallel was because this was a, a pretty much uh, well-prepared and ready transaction where a lot of upfront work uh, was done and a lot of the information and key uh, requirements uh, were for eligibility were already met uh, earlier on in the transaction to allow the PSF process to run almost in parallel. Now on who you know holds the responsibility to, or whether they receive uh, PSF secretarial resources. Um, as we mentioned, uh, PINS is the interface between the origination teams and the PSF secretariat. So PINS will um, mainly require or request key information 
that is required to complete the necessary eligibility request forms that PINS then submits to the Secretariat to obtain um, a preliminary eligibility uh, note and then subsequent information related to key aspects of the transaction like um, um, uh, integrity due diligence and other clearances and other appraisal uh, issues that you're supposed to complete. So it's really about providing the accurate information timely um, and completely to the interface, in this case, uh, PINs, and then they will do the follow-up and they will work with the secretariat to, to, to provide the necessary uh, documents uh, from the eligibility, preliminary eligibility note right up to when you receive your PSF certificate. Yeah, just to add, I mean, if, if we were to establish a parallel, um, the investment officer is responsible for processing and uh, uh, preparing the documentation for the loan. The PSF team is responsible for preparing the documentation for the risk participation. Um, I think that's the sort of parallel. And indeed, uh, Richard, you uh, highlighted that uh, it's the board of the ADF, um, uh, which has uh, uh, approval authority um, in terms of the risk participation. Um, I see another question here from, again, an anonymous attendee. Um, I would like to know if Ghana is eligible for the PSF. And my question is, I believe Ghana is a blend country, but it's eligible to the ADF. Uh, so, uh, and please somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and so my prior is yes, it would be uh, eligible projects in, in Ghana would be uh, eligible. Um, so then there's a question from uh, Rita. If the project is under the PSF and a risk materializes that necessitates a payout, does the bank have to first show the effort in place to try and recover the outstanding before a PSF claim can be paid out. No, uh, it's on demand as in after the first default takes place and obviously it's not accelerable. So we will pay uh, the PSF share of amounts due. Um, but uh, what is very clear is that uh, the bank does not have to uh, um, to, um, to uh, undertake recovery efforts before lodging a claim. A claim can be lodged 90 days after the payment was due and not made. Um, this notwithstanding, the bank does have a uh, contractual obligation to continue to supervise and uh, uh, and manage the loan as it would, um, where they should there not be a risk participation. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, if there is a default, 90 days past due, the bank can make a claim. Um, I see a question that we missed, Richard. Uh, a question on risk participation versus risk reduction. The expected upstream approach mentioned as an objective might place the PSF in a risk reduction element. Are there any concerns and mitigants to prevent that perception and the misconceptions mentioned by Richard? So the first one is that, uh, yes, I mean, the, the, the risks that exist are a lower standard of due diligence. Um, in originating the transaction. Um, and that's a form of moral hazard risk. Uh, we know that uh, it exists. However, first of all, the fact that the bank at all times will retain a skin in the game, as we say, or a share of the risk on its own books is a very strong mitigant. Um, the other mitigant is that we, uh, in terms of a new revised framework, will only share up to 50% of the risk, uh, more only in exceptional uh, cases. So that's another, that's another mitigant. Um, and um, in terms of uh, 
uh, of uh, the decision or our, our position on how we would size the risk participation. Um, in other words, whether we are would be recommending 30% or 50% risk participation would be informed by the extent to which we perceive uh, that there is a, um, a lower level of transaction readiness and uh, 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 attempts to uh, to use the you know to 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 um, to to generate this this lower level of due diligence. I don't know if Richard, you want to add something. No, I think that was that, that, that was perfect, Cécile. Il uh, y a une question aussi de Malek uh, qui demandait le montant de revenus auquel la banque renonce en ayant recours au PSF. So the risk share, the risk participation uh, premium is applied, or the structure is as follows. The only uh, component or fee component that uh, is charged is um, on the outstanding uh, loan amount. So there is no availability fee. Uh, Peut-être je vais essayer de répondre en français. Il n'y a pas de, um, de frais de mise en disponibilité tel que la banque le paye, je crois que c'est 1% sur le montant du prêt non décaissé. Uh, et uh, la, la, le, le premium qui est appliqué uh, au, uh, au, au, au montant couvert uh, représente 92% uh, de la marge sur appliquée au montant couvert. Ce montant n'est appliqué uh, que et n'est payé et n'est payable que de que uh, en arriéré et uh, seulement si la banque uh, perçoit uh, les montants de la de l'emprunteur. Donc, uh, dans le cas de de prêts uh, qui dont dont celui où il y a défaut, uh, si la banque uh, n'est pas payée par l'emprunteur, la banque ne paye pas de uh, frais de de, de 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 premium de participation au risque uh, sans que cela n'affecte uh, la validité de la uh, participation au risque. Donc, uh, si uh, un de ces prêts fait défaut, uh, la banque arrête tout de suite de payer et uh, par contre, la PSF se substitue uh, à l'emprunteur. Donc, voilà. There's, a, there's another question which I, I'm not quite sure I understand. What is the average period of PSF projects implementation and what is, are the KPI that can help us know that a project is sufficiently sustainable for going out of the support of PSF action? So I think I understand this question as being uh, two or three questions. One, um, the average period of PSF project implementation is the average period of ADB loan uh, project implementation. Um, and in this respect, uh, what we have is an instrument which by default covers the loan to full maturity. Um, so maturity for us is not a, uh, is not a, 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 a criteria, um, but we do have risk participations uh, in the portfolio, which are on uh, trade finance lines of credit, which are two and a half years, three years. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, we have risk participations in loans that are uh, increasingly in the infra sector, especially energy sector, uh, 17, 18 years. So there's no, there's no steadfast, steadfast rules. Obviously, um, uh, it all depends. I mean, you know, ideally, what we, we should be in a situation uh, is to see um, uh, PSF incubate uh, risks, uh, and then if the the commercial market is prepared to cover uh, assets that are less risky, uh, all the better. Um, but uh, the question as to whether there is a KPI that can help. Uh, to know that a project is sufficiently sustainable for going out 
of uh, PSF uh, risk participation? Maybe that's a question for the bank. Uh, are there still open questions? I think the two questions that are here have been answered. Yeah. Um, Fatma, unfortunately, I can't see the chat. If you could check on the chat yes. just to make sure we're not missing anything else. Okay, uh, there is, um, I'm not sure if this was answered since I was cut off. Okay, there is approval process are independent. However, if ADB declines, still PSF can move forward and approve their share of the loan or these two are strictly complementary to each other. Okay, thank you very much Fatma for uh, pointing us in that direction. So uh, let's be very explicit. The PSF participates in the risk of the ADB non-sovereign operations. So if the ADB declines to lend to the project or the corporate or whatever, there is no uh, loan in which the PSF can risk participate. Um, and let's remember the two types of instrument, the loan being to bring in liquidity. PSF is unfunded, so it does not bring the liquidity upfront. Uh, accordingly, I would say that these two at this juncture are strictly complementary to each other. However, one of the things that we are looking at is the possibility of PSF participating in the credit risk of loans made by special funds uh, of the bank. Voila. I think we we have all the an, all the question answered. And I'm so you can dwindle so they're all getting ready to go for lunch. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I um I think we can uh, end the webinar. And. Yep. Uh, Thank you everyone for attending this webinar. And uh, as a reminder, there are two others planned for the upcoming two weeks. The next one will be, will be the project uh, preparation uh, facility uh, next, uh, next week. And the last one on TSF. So uh, we hope to see you all at uh, these two webinars and uh, have a good lunch. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Cecile. Thanks, Fred Mayer. Thanks. Thank you for this presentation today and for your time.